Community colleges are an important uh, part of Wyoming's educational system. In a, in, a university, in a state where we have only one university, um, we are incapable of providing everything to everybody that needs it. And community colleges uh, work a par as part of that complete system to um, provide opportunities that can't be found elsewhere. They provide higher education, the area's residents, very much on a local basis, uh, be able to reach sort of uh, without going across the state or you know, disappearing down the Laramie. Both for people who want to jumpstart their university education before leaving here, and of course, for those who have no intention of leaving Gillette at all, or to the family or to work in it. Our last speaker tonight, Matthew Craig, has made his career teaching at community colleges, first in Texas, in Oklahoma, and finally in Wyoming. Here at Gillette College, he teaches across the biological sciences, recruiting students, uh, both for the nursing program and for later transfer to a four-year degree elsewhere. He handles courses in animal biology, human anatomy and physiology, as well as microbiology, the other end of the spectrum, and nutrition. He brings active learning strategies to the classroom as well as more traditional techniques. Just last year, he won the Excellence in Teaching Award from the National Society of Leadership and Success. Every biology teacher, every biology professor that I've ever encountered has their favorite animal type, and Matthew is no exception. He focuses on the fish, both in their evolution through time and their present behavior. Your behavior include how they catch the fly when you pass to let the frog nipple. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, occasionally, I notice he gets involved in other full-blood species like turtles. But tonight, he's going to turn his attention to another animal, the human animal, and he'll share some aspects of our own biological behavior, which he sees in our social interaction. So let me give you Matthew Craig, who'll speak to us about in business and political policy, biology matters. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, and it's a real pleasure, one, for me to be here. It's also, this has been a program I've really supported uh, now since uh, we moved here three years ago. And it has been a program I've really supported with wanting my students to participate in this, and some of them are here, and I appreciate that. And I also really appreciate the University of Wyoming doing this um, for the community colleges, for the communities where we serve, because they go to all of the communities Seven, is that right? I think seven. Seven communities, and uh, I know that that's a, a bit of a burden. It's a burden finding speakers, I'm sure. It's a bit of a, uh, it's a lot of work. And, and for our, our, our uh, camera person, for our uh, commitment from the four-year school and the research university to, to come here. So I really appreciate you all. So I want, well, actually, let's give them a hand for, uh, for actually coming to us for this. Thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, my field is biology, and uh, one of the things that, that what, what I'm going to talk about here tonight is sort of the intersection where biology intersects with business and, and political policy. And, and what I'm going to contend is that when business, when entrepreneurs, when, when business folks, when politicians make decisions, make policy, whether it be for their business, or whether it be politicians making it for society, that, that they can't violate biological tenants or else they're liable to see their, their policy fail, their business fail, or in some cases, just human catastrophe. And, and so, um, so I'm going to argue that it's very important that, that in these decisions that biological principles are not violated and hopefully they're understood to some degree. So, and one of the things that many people may not realize is how much intersection there is between especially the, the, the fields of economics, ecology. Uh, in fact, uh, when we look at economics and ecology, if a new ecological model comes out, you can bet that it probably is going to have application within the field of e economics. Conversely, if, if a new economics model comes out, it probably will have application in ecology. Same with animal behavior and evolution. In fact, all of these are, are, are really quite intertwined. Um, what do economists study? Economy, economists study how humans 
um, acquire and, and procure and use scarce resources? Well, what do ecologists study? How animals and organisms acquire and, and, and use and procure those other kinds of scarce resources, but scarce resources nonetheless. So they're very similar, very intertwined. So let's, um, let the first sort of example I'm going to take a look at here is how a businessman and how reproduction in a lot of organisms kind of mirror each other, they kind of dovetail. And so let's say, uh, the first little example here I'm going to use is, 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 is Joe, or we'll call him Joe and he builds birdhouses, so our entrepreneur is Joe, we'll call him Joe. Our fish, well we'll just call, our, our, our animal model will be a fish, so we'll just call it a fish. So let's say that Joe goes, he decides that he's going to open up a little business, side business, he's got another thing going, but he's going to start building birdhouses, selling them at craft shows and, and uh, things like that for a while. So it turns out that in this year, he's had a pretty good year. He made $30,000 selling these, these birdhouses and things like that. But of course, Joe didn't earn $30,000. He had expenses in order to do that. He had, I'm just, obviously these are some made up numbers, but let's say, no, they're very intensely collected numbers. That's what they are. And these numbers are, so $6,000 in raw material costs. He had to buy wood and he had to buy some, some equipment and glue and paint and all that sort of thing. So he has $6,000 in raw materials through the course of this year. He had to pay for electricity in his little garage shop that he's using. He's, uh, he had to pay vendor fees at the, at the shows where he was. He had travel costs in the form of, of gasoline to get to the vendors and into these shows as well as picking up raw materials and the like. So when it was all said and done, he didn't clear $30,000. He had $10,000 of expenses taken out of his $30,000 gross to get $20,000 net. No surprise there, right? Now, what Joe is faced with is, 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 uh, is a dilemma. What to do with that $20,000 of net profit, one of the things that Joe could do is he could take all of that profit and put it in his pocket and take it home. After all, the reason he's in business ultimately is to take money home and do things with it like buy campers and ATVs and fishing rods and uh, uh, steak maybe instead of hot dogs. So he could take all of that $20,000 profit put it in his pocket, and that's ultimately what he's probably in business for. Uh, at least a small business entrepreneur. If you get into the, the big publicly traded companies, things get a little bit different, get a little bit wonky. But for the small business person who's in it to try to uh, make money, grow their business, they're usually doing it because they want to see this, this money go home. At the end of the year, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, they want to see that money go home and increase what their, their standard of living is. So he could take all of that $20,000, put it in his pocket, and go buy a, a nicer a camper with it, right? But the problem with that plan is that what's going to happen next year? He prob what's going to happen next year? Or, yeah, he certainly, he's going to be in the same boat he was this year, right? And so how much is he going to probably clear next year? Well, if all things are the same, we can probably expect he'll, he'll get a net profit of about the same amount. He hasn't grown the business at all, he's, so he's probably in about the same boat as he would be this year. He has another option. He could plan for the future, um, and what he could do is he could, he could take all of that money, and instead of putting it in his pocket and buying a camper with it, he could put it into the business. Buy, he, he needs some more power tools. He wants some different power tools he wants to have. Um, a little shop, so instead of working in a little work area off of his garage, he goes and he puts a, he puts a, a shop in his backyard, runs some electricity to it. He may even hire someone to help him with some stuff. He grows his business. But of course, none of that money went home. The advantage of that is what's going to likely happen next year is he's probably going to see a larger net profit. So he's, he has this dilemma. He can, he can take all of the prop, profit for his present self, but that kind of effectively robs from his future self, or he can put all of it into his future self, which kind of effectively robs from his present self. 
And then, of course, there's another option, that's something in between, which is probably more likely what he's going to do. He's going to put a little bit of it in his pocket, and he's going to put a little bit of it back into the business. But it's going to, it's going to be some blend there, perhaps. But either way, it's a strategy, right? He has this strategy. He has, he has his strategy of, of, of putting it all in his pocket and using it this year. He has his strategy of putting all of it back into the business, using none of it this year. Or he can... He can modify that strategy to some degree, right? Okay, so we're going to take the fish um, and we're going to look at the same thing with the fish. Now I'm going to use a like a largemouth bass as a model. Um, most fish and certainly largemouth bass are no different. They have what we call indeterminate growth. They don't stop growing throughout their lives, unlike most mammals which do stop and so we're looking at an organism that can continue to grow. Um, and for Joe, Joe's take home is, is obviously his currency is money and his, his, his take home is the same thing as the fish's reproduction. What really matters to the fish, what matters to an organism is how much reproduction they get. At the end of their lifetime, how much reproduction was there? So for the similar thing for putting the money in Joe's pocket for the fish is having offspring. That's the important thing that this fish can do with its extra resources. And just like Joe could invest in business, what the fish can do is it can put it into growing bigger. Bigger fish can have more eggs. That means more offspring, right? But it's a similar kind of problem. So in the, in the animal world, the resource instead of being money is calories. And so how many calories can this organism get? So this fish has the ability to probably collect a certain number of calories throughout you know, a given year, a given time period. And in a lot of your largemouth bass, of course, you'll have an annual sort of reproductive cycle. Um, and so what ends up happening is the fish can take a strategy much like Joe. It can put all of its extra calories into building eggs. Well, so I've, I've kind of indicated that by it can have a certain number of offspring, therefore. So it can build these eggs, which turn into offspring. But what's going to happen next year? It's still exactly the same size, so if it keeps that strategy going, what's going to happen the next year? It's going to have the same number of eggs we would assume, you know, a, a predicted number of offspring. If we look at Joe's other option, his other option was to put it all in the business. So perhaps the fish takes the same strategy puts all of its calories, instead of into eggs, it puts all of its energy into growing bigger. Well, what's that going to do in the following year? That's going to give that fish an ability to have even more offspring. Now, if this can continue on, if this pattern continues on, which is going to be better? Well, this would be limited in my little example here to three offspring a year. Well, if we do that for four years, that would be 12 offspring. If we did this in my little scenario, we have seven offspring, we'd have two more years after this, it would have 21 offspring, 21 versus 12. So in the long run, this is a better strategy. But the fish, just like Joe, has certain consequences it has to weigh out. One of those consequences is, for the fish or for Joe, what if Joe's only going to be in business for a short period of time? What's probably his better strategy? put it in his pocket, right? If he grows it and there's not going to be a future for him, then it's, it's money that he put into his business that's lost money and he didn't put it into his pocket. For the fish, what if the fish dies? Which is the What if the fish dies after, say, one reproductive cycle, which is the better strategy? Well, this one's clearly the better strategy, isn't it? If it's going to be a short life. So it's going to kind of depend. It's got to make these choices and, of course, the bass isn't sitting there like Joe and making a choice of how it's going to allocate its resources. This is programmed in evolutionarily based on its ancestors, you know, how long its ancestors on average lived, what was their average lifespan, what was their average growth rate, what was their average um, caloric intake, etc. But it's programmed in much the same way that Joe has, has choices. And those, those organisms which pick a better strategy will tend to have more inclusive fitness, will tend to win the game. So, um, and in the end there, for the fish, it's important to how its total reproduction through its lifetime is going to be its take home. 
just like for Joe, it's to his total take home is what's important to him. And so they both have different ways. They have similar strategies to get to the best take home, if you will. And so businessmen have to make those same kinds of decisions, really, as, as animals are making them through an evolutionary sense. So, so that's sort of the first little, little uh, scenario. Let's go on to another scenario here. Um, a lot of scientists, a lot of behavioral scientists, and so animal behaviorists, uh, if they're looking at what happens in nature, we usually refer to them as ethologists. Uh, if they're a behaviorist that's really looking, they may be an animal behaviorist if they're more in the clinical setting. But one of the things that a lot of animal behaviorists in a clinical setting will use is what's called a Skinner box. And there's all kinds of different uh, manifestations of this. But a Skinner box basically is a box. It can have reward systems. Rewards are usually given in the way of like it'll drop food or a snack or a water or something like that. It'll give it some kind of a reward. While a uh, it can also be set up to give punishment. Often a punishment, usually, typically, for example, will be an electrified floor. So it'll give it an uncomfortable shock. And so there's several examples here. Um, in this particular case, uh, it has a, a response lever where um, the individual could, for example, turn off the electric shock. And that was a, the classic example. In this particular, really kind of a, really a, a very wonderful experiment that was set up by Weiss, which is similar to some other experiments. What he did, he and his team did, is they had two of these Skinner boxes, both of them electrified, but they're connected via a wire. The first Skinner box activates the second Skinner box. So both boxes are going to get exactly the same shock, the same punishment. The only difference is that, that the, uh, the lever here turns it off for experimental uh, uh, methods reasons, this has a lever, but this lever doesn't do anything. So this box is going to get the exact same shock as that box. It's just that that box can turn off the whole system and this box, it's the, the organism in this one, is just limited to whatever, whatever that shock is. It has no control over the shock. And so what happened was, put, put your rodents in here, uh, they used mice, put the rodents in, and then randomly, at random intervals, the shock would go off. Both mice will be shocked. Just that the one in the top cage has the option it can find that lever and learns how to turn it off, right? After a while, learns pretty quickly. Once the shock happens, it can go over and it can, it can actually hit that lever, turn off the shock, which turns off the shock to both boxes. But an interesting thing happens. And this has been shown in more than this experiment. The, the rodent in the top box, in my example, which can control its environment, even though it's sort of a nasty little shock, it usually does fine. It thrives, has no problem. The rodent in the bottom box will tend to fail to thrive, even to the point of, of dying. So the, upper, the, the one that has some control of its environment does great. The one that has no control over its environment does not do well. And in fact, studies have shown all kinds of things happen to the immune system, to stress, all, ki you know, all kinds of things are happening there and it does not do well. Um, so that's one, that's one example. Let's use another one. This was uh, done by uh, a, a team led by Seligman. Um, again, some, some older stuff. It's not brand new. Newer research collab collaborates this and is more refined. But what they did was they had dogs. They used dogs as their test subject. Seems a little cruel, but they had Effectively, they had them wired together. They had a harness that wired them together. They gave random shocks to the dogs. The dogs didn't like it. Um, it turns out that, and they both had levers, but it turns out that one dog, the lever works. So when they get the shock, this dog can learn if he hits that lever, he'll turn it off. Um, both dogs get the exact same shock. But what they found was that the dog that could not control its environment would Actually, and they developed a term called learned helplessness. It would, it, would, it would develop learned helplessness. And so what would happen is, of course, apply a shock. Well, what does this dog do? It figures out how to turn it off. But the other dog is subject to the same exact shock. But what will end up happening is this dog will be active. It will turn it off. This dog will fail to thrive. It will become helpless. It will submit to its, to its uncontrollable environment. It will lay down, it, when the shock starts, it may just lay down and just accept the shock, not pleasantly, 
while the other dog is active and goes and turns it off. You take those dogs out of that environment and you put them into a, uh, a similar, the same dogs, it's the exact same dogs. Now this is the dog that was able to turn off the, the shock. This is the dog that was unable to turn off the shock. And so what ends up happening is the, you, the shuttle box will allow one side to be electrified. Well, no surprise, if you electrify one side where the dog is, what do you think? There's a little, there's a little divider here. It may only be a few inches high. And for a, what is this dog going to do? Jumps to the other side. Avoids the shock, no big deal. Guess what this dog does? It lays there. And it just whimpers and accepts its fate, even though it could clearly jump over the, the box, over the little wall. But it's become so accustomed, it's learned to be helpless. If some human experiments, kind of interesting, some, some simple human experiments along the same line, um, workers, having to do some mental task with a noisy environment going off, have a button. And some of them, the workers, the, the, the people, the test subjects, by the way, you know what most test subjects are in these kinds of experiments? They're like college students age 18 to 22 in, in, who are in a psychology class. But anyway, um, so that's how, how normal is that? That seems to, right, we're trying to expand this to, to whole populations, but that's where most of your psychology experiments lie. Um, you know, because you have, you have people at research universities and that's their test subjects they have easy access to and bonus points can go a long ways, right, to getting, a, getting someone to help out. Right? Well, it's not anyway. And so what they would do is they'd have them doing some kind of a mental task with this buzzer, with this noise going and they'd have a button. Well, it would turn out that this, the, the test subjects who had the button that could turn off the noise, others couldn't turn off the noise, there was a statistically significant difference between the, the performance of the two groups. Even though the group that could turn off the noise would end up generally not turning it off. They'd usually, but they had the ability, they could control their environment and so they actually performed better. So again, the same sort of things. People, people or animals who are helpless tend to become helpless, tend to perform uh, more poorly. So. Coming back to the theme of this, how does that affect business? How does that affect policy? So some of those ramifications, if, if one is micromanaged in your business place, so I, I would actually direct this message really more to administrators and to supervisors and business owners and things like that. If they micromanage everything, if they don't let their employees have some autonomy, some decision making in the process, What's liable to happen, what are they? They're, they tend to be this, this animal right here, right? No choices, the pain of work, and all work, even if you love what you do, there's always, you know, there's always things that we don't love about what we do. And if you're in a, even a, in a job that you don't have some reward in, all the worse. So for some, so my predictions and my recommendations for the business owner, for the administrator, for the supervisor is be, incredibly careful about micromanaging your employees. Be incredibly, try to be as generous about giving your employees autonomy as much as is possible. Because m numerous studies with humans have also shown, for example, depression, lots of linkage to depression. People who feel they have no control over their world tend to have a much higher rate of depression. We've seen it over and over, they have lower immune response. By the way, depression and stress are the number one uh, suppressor of the immune response. They go hand in hand, which depression tends to lead to a poor immune response, right? And so they have poor immune responses. That tends to make them ill. They don't want to go to work. They tend to have poor attendance, um, poor work performance. So from the, their productivity goes down. And in some cases, of course, really inappropriate behavior can result sometimes to the edge of being pushed over an edge and someone does really something dumb and makes terrible decisions and, and uh, may take it out on fellow employees or bosses and things like that in a violent way. And so my suggestion again there is for businessmen to be careful uh, about over managing their, their people, give their people as much autonomy. I realize that they still have to make decisions and you know my bosses make decisions I have to live with sometimes but also I would argue my bosses give me a lot of autonomy in what I do and that's a good thing. So, all right. Let's use the last example here. 
in our last example. Um, in 1848, a German exiled to London, spent a lot of time in, in London museums, came up with an idea of this utopia, and he, he thought, man, he hated seeing the, the differences in society of the haves and the have-nots, and, and, and how some people really, of course, were, were struggling. And he didn't actually coin this term, but he's credited with, he's, he used it, actually a, a, a gentleman named Louis Blanc, uh, coined it, but, but uh, this guy, of course, used it. From each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. Obviously, we're talking about Karl Marx. Karl Marx, who, who wrote his Communist Manifesto, published it in 1848. Um, he thought that capitalism would, would just stumble on its own greed and its own problems and would fail, and he, he envisioned a utopia that, would, that would, it would see all people with their needs being served. Um, and all people, you know, being tasked with working and giving basically to the state, giving all their, all their resources to the state, and then the state would decide how that would be uh, distributed so that none were without. Now, he knew there was a problem because, of course, people are not altruistic. I've talked about that in class. We are not altruistic. Um, I am here for selfish reasons. I'll admit it. Many of you are here for selfish reasons. Yet good things happen because we're all selfish. I really believe that. Good things happen because we're selfish. But people are inherently selfish. Animals are inherently selfish. When we look at animal behavior, all these behaviors that we used to look at that we would think is, are altruistic, if we reflect on them closely, we realize they're not, so, they're not selfless. They're very, they're very selfish. Um, in the time that we have here, I don't really have a lot of time to go into that. But from an animal behaviorist standpoint, look for the selfish reason and you probably are closer to the truth than looking for a selfless reason for a behavior. And that's true in, in humans. And about the time that Marx is in the, developing his ideas, in fact, I think 1809, a gentleman by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck came up with, a, with an idea because we, they were seeing in the fossil record, they saw that the record, that the fossils were changing clearly Organisms were not immutable. They changed through time. And now they're struggling. They're trying to figure out, have an explanation. Why would that be? And he came up with this idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics. The inheritance of acquired characteristics. Which sounds sort of close to what Darwin came up with, and as well as a guy named Wallace that uh, doesn't get enough credit. And that was inheritance, uh, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, descent with modification. That may sound a lot alike. Darwin didn't realize it, but this is genetics based. This is not. And in fact, so let me give you an example of, of how Lamarck envisioned what we now refer to as Lamarckism, this inheritance of acquired characteristics. And he actually used giraffes as the example. Some giraffes, the way, how do you get a giraffe with a long neck? Well, the prototype animal had a shorter neck, and they would stretch their neck for leaves. And some of those would stretch it as because they stretched their neck, they developed a longer neck, which because they developed a longer neck, they would pass that off to their offspring. So that's an acquired characteristic. In fact, we can look, and that, and that was the idea. Well, Darwin reads this and he goes, Eureka, I have found my solution. Because he knew that people were not in, in, inherently altruistic. But he said, Lamarck says that people, that organisms can pass on to their offspring, can pass on acquired characteristics. And he said, huh, we can at the point of a gun force people to be altruistic. And then they're, they'll get altruistic and they'll pass that altruism off to their offspring. And so do that for a generation or two, and we can kill a bunch of people in the process if we need to, because after all, the end justifies the means. We can kill off all these people, we'll get rid of the ones who aren't going to comply, and then the people who do comply will become altruistic and they'll pass that off to their offspring. There's only a serious problem with that, and it is that Lamarckism doesn't work. It turns out there's a little edge of it that probably is working, but here's two examples that I can give you right here. We have this... Uh, uh, you know, there are some peoples in the world that, for example, will, um, tends to be women that will stretch their necks, right? 
and and it's thought of as as a as a as a uh, status symbol and, and beauty, and so they'll stretch their neck sometimes to the point of being very fragile, very very delicate necks. Well, if Lamarck was right, what would this woman's children have? Stretched necks. Well, they don't. All the children have to have their necks stretched, right? For those of you thinking about a gauge, your children would all then have holes in their ears, right? In other words, because this is an acquired characteristic, right? This was acquired after they were born. Therefore, if Lamarck was right, this should be passed on to their offspring. And clearly it isn't. So Lamarck was wrong. Now we do have some things called epigenetics, and we're recognizing that certain genes might be able to be turned on and turned off, and that might be able to be passed sort of to offspring. So there's this little tiny bit of Lamarckism, which may be true, but effectively not. And so what ended up happening, of course, was you had, you had much of Asia and uh, other parts of the world that, uh, that embraced communism, and at least 100 million people were killed trying to implement communism, and it utterly failed, right? It just utterly failed. It turned into tyrannical not to, to tyrannies rather than, rather than you know, some kind of a um, u utopia. And so, again, so when politicians make decisions and make, make uh, policies, this is sort of my, my penultimate you know, example of better make sure that it doesn't violate biological principles or it's liable to, to end in, a, in catastrophe. And I think with that, we'll, we'll call it quits there.